asking, what do you think aliens look like? They're sad because they think that we don't like them. It really depends on how long they've been evolving. That's an alien. <laughs> aliens have noses? There's no right answer since no one really knows. But we often imagine extraterrestrials to look a certain way because we've encountered them in books, films, or on TV shows. Oh my god, it's one of those face hunters from the alien movie! Which means that when we think about aliens, we're usually thinking about the product of someone else's imagination. This is the first film featuring life out in space, A Trip to the Moon by Georges Méliès. It came out in 1902. And the strange moon aliens in it are not at all that strange. They actually look a lot like us. These creatures were incredibly ambitious at the time, but they were also convenient. Partly to do with even the practicality of having, needing someone to play it, you know? This is Charlie Henley, an Oscar-nominated visual effects supervisor who worked on Ridley Scott's Alien series. So yeah, he spends a lot of time thinking about aliens. So obviously sometimes it's just like, well, we'll dress somebody up. How you feeling? Good. Good? Okay. So they're gonna end up with a head and arms and legs, you know, so the idea that they would relate to us if they're intelligent. And so be kind of similar. But that's not how everyone sees it. We don't have any reason to believe that they would look anything like us. The form of a, of a human being is the result of several billion years of evolution. There's no reason to believe that the development of life would be so similar as it was on Earth, that the sort of the, the form of, of life would, would look anything like we have on Earth. That's Andrew Simeon, the director of SETI Institute, where they conduct experiments to detect extraterrestrial technology. We're lucky in that we don't have to think too much about the biological organism, the specifics of the life that created the technology, because we just search directly for the technology, and then we use that as a proxy for the, the existence of life. But imagining alien organisms, especially ones with relatable features, is what feeds a popular theme in science fiction, the relationship between us and them. There's always a point of contact, an interaction that's sometimes hostile, and other times it leads to a warm and fuzzy relationship. Quite often we, wanna, we kind of want to put ourselves onto the alien, you know, in their stories. It's like it has an element of being human. And that's made for some powerful storytelling. Are they good or are they bad? What would we do if they try to communicate with us? I think those are their names. So what are we going to call them? Science fiction has stuck around as a major Hollywood genre for decades. With more advanced visual effects technology in recent years, filmmakers had more room to experiment with the alien form. But even with the right tools, it can be hard to break out of what we already know. Normally, there's a bit of a history for the, for the film. There's some DNA that you want to follow. For example, the, uh, the, the neomorph in the new alien is effectively like a new creature that Ridley uh, wanted to create. But it had the DNA of the original alien. Um, so there's obviously features that relate to that. That connection creates a strong sense of nostalgia for a franchise like Alien. But sometimes when creators break away from that DNA, that leads to new forms. In the Edge of Tomorrow, there's a creature called a Mimic. And it, we, we did some design work for that originally. Well, the brief for that was so it shouldn't be humanistic, obviously, and it shouldn't follow the normal laws. And that's a difficult task for filmmakers. But the challenge with anything like that is that if it doesn't follow laws that we know, then it, it, you, it's hard to sell it as something real and tangible. They need to come up with something totally new, but also have it make sense to us. Often, the trick is to find inspiration in nature. So, for example, the, the neomorph we reference these goblin sharks, which are quite rare, found in the deep sea, and they and they uh, have a particular quality to the skin, but also just the mechanism of how their mouths open. Or the ink squirting heptapods in Arrival, they're otherworldly but still familiar. And even Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy. Who effectively is an alien, but you know, not in any classical sense. Like he's kind of made out as a, he's like made out of tree. The design brief there is to make him friendly, but also figure out the technicalities of how it's going to work. 
These aliens come from someone else's imagination, and they might not be entirely rooted in science, but the depictions make us think about life beyond our planet. We're, we're all sort of wondering about, about the same thing, and I think some people draw pictures of it, and some people make movies about it, and some people make music about it, and some people talk to their friends and family, and some scientists try to, to determine the answer using the principles of basic science and, and observational astronomy. But it's, it's all part of, I think, the same human question, which, which is, of course, are we alone?